Good morning and welcome to the Talking City podcast, the Manchester City podcast from the Manchester Evening News. If you're listening to this on an audio platform, you don't recognise my voice. My name is Seb Parkinson. I am stepping in today for Joe Bray and Tyrone Marshall, who are both unavailable for various reasons. It's uh, delighted to be joined by Simon Bykowski. And I first, before we start, I do want to apologise that we are recording only on a Friday this week rather than earlier in the week uh, due to unforeseen circumstances as the psychic who cancelled at the pub recently said, we were unable to record earlier in the week. So we are going to bring you our review of Man City's 5-0 win against Huddersfield from the weekend, which feels like an age ago, Si. But um, yeah, if you just want to bring through uh, Phil Foden and Matteo Kovacic, again, a player who's not been that standout-ish for Man City this season, has starred. So uh, Sam, yeah, just want to run through the game and and review it, really. Yes, it was um, very straightforward, really. Quite a difficult uh, opening for City with Huddersfield defending very, 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 very deep. It was quite sort of impressive almost to see that how 10 players could be so close together on the pitch as, as Huddersfield were. But um, a bit of magic from Phil Foden broke the, the deadlock after a really good pass from Matteo Kovacic into Alvarez. Um, Foden scored twice, ran the show, looked in as good a form as he as he has been in the last few games. He's really um, enjoying that central role and spoke after the game and said, yeah, I want to stay there. This is where I want to play. So, you know, as much as kind of the return of other players, you might think Foden might get pushed out wide. He, he wants to stay in the middle. Uh, another goal for Julian Alvarez, a real sort of poachers finish um, to continue his his run, uh, the the big the big news was Kevin De Bruyne coming back, coming back off the bench, and uh, providing an assist within 17 minutes, but um, sort of staying on the pitch for the whole game and doing all right. And uh, his assist was for Jeremy Doku, who also returned from injury, albeit he's only been out for sort of five weeks rather than five months, but still important to see Doku back and. And on the score sheet straight away. And, you know, De Bruyne will open up so many channels to so many players um, with his vision. So um, that is is something else to watch out for. And then uh, we got a chance to speak to Kevin after the game, who is really happy with, you know, the way his, his rehabilitation has, has gone, really. Um, he was asked kind of about this setback he had in August because um, obviously he did hamstring injury in the Champions League final after kind of playing injured on it for two months. Um, came back, played against Arsenal in the Community Shield and then started against Burnley and broke down and was out again. So so loads of people said, oh, he, you know, he came back too early, City rushed him back and he kind of just said no. He was like, it, it's just real bad luck. Um, separate injuries same hamstring um, he's happy to have had the rest he's had some family time he doesn't think he'll be straight back into the starting lineup against Newcastle um, he thinks it's going to be a bit of time coming back but it can only be a good thing for, for City that uh, he's back because he is so important to this team yeah and you tweeted uh, uh, half four on the day of the game in the last 10 starts together for Man City with Phil Foden and Alvarez Foden got two Alvarez got a goal and assist against Huddersfield prior to that Alvarez goal Foden two assists Foden goal Alvarez goal Alvarez two and assist Foden one prior to that Alvarez uh, Foden assist prior to that Alvarez assist and then Foden goal Alvarez assist Foden goal Alvarez goal Alvarez assist so how is De Bruyne going to get back in this team I, I mean, I think you will always find a way for De Bruyne because he is so, so important. And you've also got that kind of second, secondary midfield role, which no one really is, has put their, put their mark on. Um, you know, Kovacic has looked much better in the last few performances and, and we're still seeing potential from Nunes, who came on early for, for Manu Akanji, who went off injured against against Huddersfield. Um, the other kind of big team news from the Huddersfield game was uh, no Erling Haaland still, and uh, and he wasn't in training on Thursday. Um, so still concerns about him going forward. And, and the point of kind of the, the Foden and Alvarez start and my, my match report from Saturday was that we're, when Erling Haaland is back and fit, he starts and he scores goals. And when De Bruyne is fit, he comes back into this team and he scores goals and assists. But they've not been fit for a while. And while they've not been fit, it's been Foden and Alvarez who have been 
doing the business. So Foden and Alvarez are going to be very hard to to dislodge from from the team. I think when you know when Haaland and De Bruyne are both fit, um, one of them probably loses out. But until that happens, they're just going to keep going. And you know, it's a real bonus for Guardiola to have been able to rely on two players who really weren't a major part of the the treble success last year to um to carry the team's attack through while um while De Bruyne and Haaland and Doku have all been out. Yeah, well just looking ahead as well, City have got five games in February and another five games in March, at the very least as well, you know, done any FA Cup replays or anything like that in there, that will add to it. So in a way it's a good headache for Pep to have to have the players coming back and fighting for a place. It's sort of a pain for him to have to leave one of them out, but ultimately, you know, to have those players available. I remember City last season with all the injuries that they had, they all seemed to come back for the running. So whilst everybody was stretching their team, it was almost like City were had five, four or five new signings and that really helped propel them to go on and win that treble. So yes, while they're coming back, De Bruyne is coming back a bit earlier then obviously that happened, but it's, it's, it must be almost like having a new sign in to be able to rotate and bring some players in. And obviously if he, if he is not going to be the De Bruyne of when he was 27, you know, cause he's 32 going on 33 now, he, um, you know, if he is going to be playing less games and slowly phased out over the next two, three years into a lesser position, which may be the case, may not be the case, but at least he's got, players coming in uh, uh, the quality of Foden the quality of Alvarez to be able to to sit in that sit in that uh, sit in that position like what what are your thoughts on on the future of Kevin De Bruyne should he stay fit do you think he can get back to his best and do you think he is a player that can stay in the next three four years or do you think the the the, the phasing of De Bruyne on is is in, is in progress um, I I think we saw last season kind of the dangers of writing De Bruyne off. Um, you know, he, he lost his place in the team last season. And uh, I remember he came off the bench at Palace for, for 10 minutes in, must have been February or March. And uh, I spoke to him after the game and sort of asked him about this sort of, you know, maybe changing of the guard. And he was like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm an old man in this game. I know it works if you're not. Uh, on top you you kind of left behind and and those quotes kind of real really picked up and he sat down I think a few days later for a press conference before a Champions League game and it was almost like people were sort of writing his obituaries talking about like you know the oh do you still think you've got any time left in the at the highest level and and all this and then he showed from then on in the last few months kind of just what a player he remains and I mean for me that goal he scored against Real Madrid at the Bernabeu when City were right under the cosh is one of the most important goals um, of of the season if if he doesn't score that I'm not sure they win the Champions League because Real were all over them and 1-0 up and it was such an important goal and you know doing it while you're injured as well is um, is unbelievable so it, it feels it it's funny because, you know, City had another Belgian who was quite good at football um, in Vincent Company who was injured a lot and had to do a lot of comebacks and was always fighting back. And it it kind of feels like De Bruyne is into that bracket now where you associate him with, with injury because he's kind of had two, three bad ones on the bounce, really. Um, so he's going to have to do work to you know, convince everyone that he can still, still be at the top. And when, you know, we speak of these selection dilemmas that Guardiola has in the immediate future, um, they may never come because, you know, De Bruyne might not stay fit for the rest of the season. Harlem might not stay fit for the rest of the season. So if, if that doesn't happen, then, you know, Guardiola will have to rely on the, the players that he's got. But yeah, in, in the longer term, you know, I think De Bruyne's contract, is till the end of 2025 or the, the the summer 2025 um so you know he, he's an old enough man in the game to know that you know if he's not still contributing then um he, he's going to be phased out but i think like company i think he will he's got so much talent and you know more so than company even, but he's got phenomenal ability that nobody else has with this vision that he's got. Um, I think he will leave City when he leaves City. He will leave on a high, um, having kind of 
shown that he, he's still at a top level. I don't think we're going to see a, a decline of De Bruyne at City. Yeah, because I think with like Gundogan was what, was he 32, 33 when, when he left? And then Sergio Aguero, probably of a similar age. Pep Guardiola making that 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 sort of memeified, uh, we'll never replace him, we'll never replace him sort of moment. And in a way, like I guess, you know, with, with Gundogan leaving, it's left a bit of a hole at City and City is still trying to replace him of sorts. And <laughs> you're seeing a lot of younger players come through, like you Phil Foden. You know, he's been in that team, what, four or five years now? He's not like he's a kid, even though he's still only in his early 20s, realistically, or maybe into his mid-20s now. And at some point, you're sort of hoping that, that Phil Foden will come into that team and be the next De Bruyne or the next Gundogan type player. You know, you've still got Bernardo Silva there. Every year, it seems that he wants to wants to move on, but he's happy when he stays. So if Pep Guardiola does extend his stay beyond the next 18 months, you know, it's almost like the rebuild really has to start now. And I guess a lot of City fans are, are questioning with the with the um, the Premier League charges that are still sort of lingering in the background. Pep Guardiola's future, it hasn't been extended. Kevin De Bruyne contracted until 2025. Where do you see the future for Man City in the next 18 months? It, it, this could all be resolved in a matter of days when Pep Guardiola signs a new deal and, and you know, and De Bruyne does. But, as of right now, as a Man City fan, you know, we'll live in the, the dream at the minute, treble winners going for Premier League number four, potentially a double treble. Don't ever mention that to Pep though, because I think Joe, Joe, Joe got the, uh, the, the bad end of the stick on doing that. But, you know, I think it was Tyrone who was saying that he, he believed that Pep may have been quitting, quitting Man City, you know, during the Club World Cup where he said, oh, you know, it's been eight years and we basically won everything now. So uh, where we're at now, obviously, is living on this high. Like, wh- where's the future? Um, yeah, it's difficult to say. I think um, the, I don't think anyone would be surprised if Guardiola left at the end of his contract. Um, I think they would be surprised if he left before his contract because he's never um, sort of ended a contract early. And, you know, if he does decide to extend, it'll probably be in the next season when he does or at the end of this season. Um, But what has been the surprise is that he's been here for so long. You know, nobody is, even his closest friends didn't expect him to, to be here for nine years when he he came in 2016, having been at his boyhood club for four years and, and by Munich for three years. So it's what has been significant is that, you know, he's still, He's still going. He said he'll leave when, you know, his message isn't going through. I spoke to Nathan Ake last week for an interview that's on the site now. And and he was saying like, Pep is the one. Pep was telling them about the Super Cup and the Club World Cup and everything that they need to do. There's a sign in the gym now that says, you know, nobody's won four Premier Leagues in a row yet. Like everything is driving them on. And, and Pep is leading the the squad and the, and the squad are following what they see from from this guy so uh, as long as he's there and he's you know he's there for at least the next 18 months that there is going to be this unsatiable drive for trophies and that's why sort of you know to to get caught up i think once you start looking beyond that um you sort of risk upsetting what's already there and uh, taking your eye off the off the ball of it, which is this kind of like relentless drive to, to win more and more and more. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, De Bruyne will be 33, 34, I think when his contract, um, is up and they will have to make a decision, you know, letting Aguero go was, was not easy. Um, and they let him go and then couldn't get a striker that summer. So it was, it was very, difficult for them but they were you know as hard as it was to let him go it was a a decision made for the future because they wanted you know Kane and Har- Kane or Haaland basically to um to come in and and take over so you know when the time is right for for De Bruyne to go I think he'll go with um the the best kind of farewell but he, he's also shown that he's he's not uh not not getting ready for a farewell yet. He thinks he's got plenty of football left, left in him. So I, yeah, it, you know, you, you look at the next 18 months and think there is a hell of a lot to be won between now and then. 
And the beauty of it is when you look at Man City's academy, which we'll get onto in, in part two, is how the production of players that's coming through that academy is just, they're getting better and better and better. You've seen Cole Palmer go to Chelsea, what, 40, 45 million there or thereabouts. He's, he looks like an absolute prime player. And he's only what, I think he's 21, 22. And he, he looks fantastic. He's settled right in there. You've got Phil Foden in City. Then you've got the lads coming through the academy, like your Micah Hamilton's, your Rico Lewis is now part of that first team. So it's not even like we're looking at City going, oh God, you know, when Pep goes, we're finished. We've got no no backup plan. It's like whatever, it's almost like what Fergie was doing at United for, for many years, where he was bringing a production of players through, signing the odd player, but then bringing them through the academy as well. And Pep's done such an amazing job. The City group, really, not just Pep, as, Pep himself, but the, the, whole, the whole entity of Manchester City has really taken that well and it and it, it it leads to a really bright future but we'll leave that there for part one side like i say we'll jump in and talk about the the new academy in uh, in part two so if you want to stick around we'll be back in just a sec Welcome back to part two of the Talking City podcast. Going off a bit of a tangent there. like to do that now and again, don't we? Um, but uh, so I just want to bring in, uh, there was a video that City posted earlier this week of Carl Walker dressed as a security guard. It was like a 12 minute video that they put on Twitter. Something that you just don't do on Twitter because people have the attention span of a, of a goldfish on that platform. But um, what was all that about? And, and the sort of things I was hearing from it is it was cementing him being the new captain. Yeah, it's. Um, I think there was a bit of surprise when it was announced that Walker's the the new captain, and we've kind of seen through the season in the way that he's he's been on the pitch, but also the way he's spoken off it of kind of what he brings as a captain and why he is um, different from captains that have gone before him, and certainly replacing Gundogan, who was who was very kind of not quiet, but you know, softly spoken, didn't really um, make a big fuss. Whereas Walker is much more kind of one of the jokers. And uh, we saw this in the video with him sort of dressing up as a security guard and, and pranking De Bruyne and um, things like that. Basically, he wants to be a bit more fun around. Well, he, he's continuing being fun around the dressing room, but also kind of um, stepping up more when he needs to as captain. He was part of the leadership group um, last season, I think. So, it, you know, it's not entirely new for him, um, but kind of nice to see that despite him taking on the role of captain this season, he's not kind of like lost what was his his voice in the dressing room and his ability to uh, play up. That's really good. I think, I think a lot of people get confused about the whole captaincy thing at City because traditionally you have a captain and a vice captain where City have got like a, a captain's group haven't they and Kyle Walker very vociferously comes out and says I'm not the captain I am the current lead wearer of the armband and there's a group of us and, it, and it's like Kyle just say I'm the captain yeah <laughs> we we all know you're the captain you're, you're the but I guess in a way it's just to try and keep the uh keep everything together but um City announced this week then and it was an exclusive from yourself I believe uh, that was a, there's a new training center being built. So what's the script? Yes. Uh, planning application at, at least um, to the Manchester city council. They are hoping they will, they will get approval. It's on their own land. So I, I, I can't see too many reasons why um, they would struggle to get it through, but basically um, they want to build a brand new kind of training center for the women's team. So as it stands, you have kind of two um, two main buildings in the academy, in the you know the the city football academy I'm speaking of now, which is essentially the training ground. So one of the buildings houses the men's team, and the other building, which is kind of um, built in the same way, houses the academy and the women's team. So you know, the women's game growing all the time. And obviously they do have tremendous facilities as it is at the training ground. And they've got the, the new joy stadium with the, the naming rights for the, the women's team. Um, but city field at the time is right for the, the women to move to their own kind of bespoke training facility, um, whereby they can, you know, continue to, to, to go from, from strength to strength really. And I think, we city have been 
sort of at the at the forefront of of helping to to drive the growth of the women's game and uh, i think this is another example where we're a long way from sort of players being kind of locked out of training grounds and being forced to train at ungodly times because you know the men's team need it or the academy need it or anything like that that's you know gone on at, at really big clubs before um i think it's city having the the money to to put into uh city women and women's football and and showing that they're they're willing to to do that so you know it's it, it can only be good for 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 city in the women's game really really good to see that city investing again like they, they're doing everything right you know they're, they're investing they're buying the land they're investing in it they're investing in the community they're bringing jobs into manchester what's not to like si uh, moving on then so this is a bit more of a, a negative look um City and Spurs in the FA Cup has been announced as being on a Friday night, eight o'clock kickoff. We had this with the Charity Shield and then the, the, the fans protested it and then it got moved an hour forward. So, Sai, what, what's going on here? Why have they done this? Uh, because they don't care about match going fans, basically. Um, there, there isn't any other reason. The, the Community Shield um, was, was telling... Uh, in that, you know, the statement that came out from the FA said that they had moved the original kickoff time kind of back an hour after taking, you know, in full consideration of the fans. You think, well, why didn't you take in full consideration at the at the first point? Um, I can't see any logic behind uh, playing Tottenham v Man City on a Friday night. I know that someone has to play there and... You know, Tottenham City is one of the ties of the round, but it, it's also one of the most inconvenient and one of the most illogical. Um, I know plenty of fans who were planning, because the thing is you get a bigger allocation for the FA Cup for away fans, and Tottenham is the one of the biggest stadiums in the country. So loads of City fans were, were planning on, you know, taking family members who don't normally go or, you know, taking kids who've never been. And that is all a lot of that is all gone now because you're playing Friday night, eight o'clock, right? So you've got to take Friday afternoon off work or Friday, you've got to take the kids out of school on Friday afternoon in order to travel down. Game kicks off at eight o'clock and it doesn't finish until 10. When's the last train back from Houston? 10. So if you were planning to make a day of it, it's now going to be a day and a night with an overnight stay in London. And the stupidity of you know, the, the scheduling is that City are playing, as scheduled, City are playing at the start of February against Brentford on a Monday night at Brentford. However, if the FA Cup game is a replay, City versus Brentford away will move to a Saturday night at eight o'clock. So you're, going, you're asking City fans to travel down to Spurs next, um, uh, the 27th of Jan, booking overnight stays and they won't know until the game is finished whether or not they need to travel back to London the next Saturday or the next Monday if they want to watch Brentford so that there's just no consideration and like I say like you need to play another you need to play a game on the Friday night and you know say say they put Newport or Eastley against United on that Friday night that'd be no consideration for the United fans um, however Newport and Eastley's ground is pretty small. So the amount of fans affected is a lot less than taking one of the biggest stadiums in the country and asking like 9,000 fans to make the journey between Manchester and London in a country whose transport infrastructure is absolutely ruined. Um, it, it, it's just a nonsense. And, uh, you know, there isn't really a way back from this situation because all the clubs have signed up and, you know, the fans will follow the t team wherever they wherever they can. But it, it's it's it stinks. Yeah, I mean, you could even look at it and think, do you know what? What we'll do is we'll we'll find a tie that has got two teams that are not too far away from each other in the country. At least then if we put it eight o'clock on a Friday night. So say if Leicester get through against and play Birmingham. So Hull City v Birmingham and replay Leicester at home. Hull City, uh, Birmingham travelling to Leicester, what, half an hour, 40 minutes in the car or, or the coach? As I think City had it with the FA United, obviously the same, in the FA Cup final on 3rd of June. Trains were all on strike, so everybody had to drive down or get a coach. City then got 
you know, got shafted for the community shield. And it's almost like it's happening again. So why why is this happening? I mean, you probably can't answer this, but why do you think this is happening to City fans? Is it is it just bad luck? Is it coincidence? Is it because City are on the rise and that more people want to watch them on TV? So there's more of a demand for them. So that's why? Yeah, I mean, it is one of the ties of the round and City are, you know, going to be on telly more often than than not. You know, even their, their home game against Huddersfield got picked up um, to go on iPlayer. So it is that case. But I think, you know, what what the you know the people who boycotted the community shield said at the time and they weren't always listened to was this can happen to any team at any point because you know there's no like agenda against city and you've seen like you've seen liverpool get um a load of 12 30 early kickoffs after international breaks which isn't at all helpful to them um but you know those fans who boycotted the community shield said this this is happening and it will continue to happen and you need to take a, a stand against it. And, uh, you know, and this is just another example that, that does affect City, but there will be other examples. You know, Villa are playing Chelsea on the Friday night in a game that hasn't even been picked for telly yet. So, you know, Villa fans having to make that journey as well. So it, it's not just City fans. Um, and it, yeah, it, it's just no consideration for the people who are shelling out a load of money to um to go and watch their team and provide the atmosphere that the TV companies are so desperate to have. Yeah, because the, the the main irritation from from like a city fans perspective or from a fan of the club that affected is that fans of other clubs don't look beyond the end of their nose. They just troll them and just say, ah, you stop crying, you know, city fans, we've well, got no fans anyway. So what are you whinging about? You know, Liverpool fans, it's like, oh well look at all that success that you've had. Stop whinging about it. You've got the money to support it. It's like, but the longer this goes on, the more teams it's going to affect. And the more that fans drown other fans out, the execs up top in the shirts and ties, in the, in the suits, in the offices go, <clears throat> we don't need to do anything because they're just fighting amongst themselves. They're, 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 they're shooting each other down. You know, until all these football fans come together and say, no, we're just not having it anymore. It's going to continue, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how long till they say, you know what, to keep the FA Cup relevant, we need to play the fourth round in Jeddah. So all City fans and Tottenham fans have to go out to Saudi Arabia for Friday night, and 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 that's that. And uh, and you know, and the fifth round will be in Miami, and the sixth round will be in Sydney, and you just keep keep going like that. He, he mentioned the, the Super League before, like that's what everyone is is trying to to avoid. But the the sort of the people in charge having said after the whole Super League collapse that, you know, fans are so important to this game and we must never forget the fans. Well, they're not forgetting, you know, the the fans who will sit in their homes and sort of watch on TV and give them nice fancy um, numbers for engaging with that content. But, you know, they are not caring one bit for for the fans who've got to make the journeys. And like I say, provide the atmosphere. You know, what's all that nonsense? Like football without fans is nothing. Well, you know, you, you sort of think nothing of fans to to expect them to to sort of just put themselves out time and time and time again. And there will be some fans who take it as a badge of honour that, you know, they take or, you know, they, they head down straight after work on Friday make it just in time for kickoff and, and rock back through the front door at four in the morning. And you know, what a, a great trip it's been and, and fair play to them, but it's too much to ask kind of every fan to, to think like that or to think that that's acceptable for them. Well, the, and, and the thing is with the game growing and obviously the fan base is growing, there are people around the world and around the country more so in, in, the, in, in what we're talking about who, so whilst you'll say, well, city fans are boycotting the game, but then they've got a full away end. It's like, but not every Man City fan nowadays, shock horror, lives in Manchester. You know, a lot of people who are from Manchester who work in London or a lot of from Manchester who've moved to other parts of the country and the only opportunity they get is to go and watch their team in an FA Cup when there's a bigger allocation. So whilst there is the, the, the idea that we shouldn't travel to go to that game, there are fans who, as you say, are willing to, but there are also fans who are based around the country who will... And, you know, City are getting a lot of foreign fans now. Like, you know, Man United, City fans 
have, have mocked Man United fans for it for many years, but now a lot of City fans are starting to see in their own stadium and with, with social media, you're seeing pictures of people. People are taking pictures of other fans videoing the game and mocking them. And it's like, but you're taking a picture of them, so you're just as bad. <laughs> you know, if you think that they're bad for taking a picture and videoing the game, well, you're doing the same to them. But it's just the, the game's so global now. You know, I think 30, 40 years ago, when it was, you know, our game and then the Premier League was launched and the Premier League's just gone so global now that everybody wants to come to this country to watch it. And I think we, we talked about it on a podcast not so long since where British people will travel to Amsterdam and then go and watch the local teams there or travel to somewhere somewhere in Europe that you've never heard of and go and watch the local team. And, you know, you might get some pictures and video there. So what's the difference? There isn't really a difference, but it's just, you know, the way it's perceived in this country. But uh, just on that game, Si, City, City v Spurs. So City going to Spurs is one thing on a Friday night, but City going to Spurs to a stadium that they've never won at against a team they've never beat in that stadium against the team they've never scored against in that stadium. Like it's a, it's a fascinating start. And I think Pep Guardiola was asked about it by Sky Sports after they'd won the treble or just before they won the treble and said, if you win the treble, what's your biggest ambition? And Pep's response was to score an away goal at Tottenham. So how actually important and actually significant could this game be for City's, you know, four in a row race later on in the season? Yeah, it could be massive. Um, I think back to last season when City hosted Arsenal in the fourth round at the end of January and it, Arsenal were the better team really, um, but City sort of clung on and scored a goal and won the game. And not only did that kind of help them win the treble, but that it's hard not to see that and think that the psychological sort of barrier that was lifted, not that there maybe was one for... City but maybe Arsenal who were streets ahead in the league turn up to City um, don't play a full strength team by any means but you know ha played really well had they got that win I'm not sure if City come back and beat them in the Premier League but as it was City beat them in the FA Cup then they went to the Emirates a few weeks later beat them in the league even though they weren't really the better team and that kind of snowballed into City feeling like they could overtake Arsenal and Arsenal feeling like City were going to overtake them because they were the better team. So the FA Cup does bleed into other competitions and, um, you know, <laughs> there will be wild celebrations from Guardiola when, when City do score at Spurs because there has been a lot of disappointment uh, at that stadium. It, it is quite unbelievable how they've managed not only to, to, to lose every game there, but also that they've, they failed to, uh, to score and just like they've come up with so many different ways to 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 lose there and not score there it's um it, it is quite quite something so it so now they get two goals to to score at the stadium this season and yeah it's probably well it is it's one of the the worst draws city could have in terms of the quality of the opposition if you ask him for an fa cup fourth round tie you don't want tottenham away um, however, it's another one of those games, a bit like Newcastle coming up really, where if they win it, then it will go a long way towards pointing them and them being seen in the eyes of other people as, you know, possible or probable winners of the, the whole competition. Yes, yeah, true. Cause we lost, I think in the last round, it was Arsenal via Liverpool. So you, you lost one, one of the, the big, the big teams there this round, you've got city Spurs and is it Chelsea Villa? So you're going to lose two of the two of the favourites, basically. And, you know, if Man United can edge past Eastleigh or Newport, you know, by some miracle, then then you're going to have United are going to be looking favourable for that, especially if Tottenham managed to beat City, which on paper, based on City's results at that stadium, is is sort of how you would how you would edge it. But I think the, the best result for City would be an own goal, one nil win away, <laughs> given that they can't score. But City have got that one with the training camp, haven't they, coming up? Or, or they might already be... Yeah, they won't be there now, will they? Because they're playing Newcastle. Uh, so you got that one with the training camp come up. And then they travel to Spurs. So is this City's best opportunity to beat them uh, that they've ever had? No, because they have had a lot of big opportunities where they should have beaten them and managed to contrive to lose. But but it is it, it's kind of nice the way it's worked out with players on the way back from injury like De Bruyne that he has got that time to to rest rather than, um, you know, risking uh, 
getting more injuries in games and risking coming back too soon and getting knocks like that. And the same goes for Stones and Haaland, really. Like City know that they have got a week in Abu Dhabi where they can, um, you know, perform at their best, really, and um, have the best preparation for, for for Spurs on on that FA Cup weekend. And then, you know, the rest of the schedule, which will be pretty relentless if they want to stay in every competition from from then on so um I, th- I think it's a it's a nice build-up for them and that is you know the the whole premise of the winter break they they could have played Brentford in this time at home the game that was rearranged or postponed for their club world cup participation but they haven't um and that is designed to to give players as big a rest as possible so you know they they won't have any excuses going into this Spurs game because they they should be coming into it um, you know in in good health and spirit. Brilliant, right? Well, we'll end part two there, and then we'll uh, we'll jump back in in part three. We'll talk a bit about transfers, and then we'll preview that Man City trip to St James's Park at the weekend. Welcome back to part three of the Talking City podcast. I hope I've not chewed your ears off too much. I hope you've enjoyed, enjoyed the, the standing host. But if you don't like me, you'll be happy to know that I won't be here very, very much longer because hopefully we'll have Joe or Ty back very soon. But Si, it's January. It's silly season. Transfers. It doesn't seem to happen with City as much as it does across across Manchester in, over in Stratford um, with, uh, with transfer gossip and everything. So. Is there any transfer gossip? Is there anything to talk about? Is there any news other than Calvin Phillips, who still seems to be a Man City player? Well, Phillips is the big one. Um, you know, we're at we're at the stage where Phillips needs to move. Um, City will happily keep him, and I think that's part of the part of the issue. Really, um, Newcastle are front runners to sign Phillips, um, take him on loan. They've obviously. Uh, lost the services of Sandro Tonali for um, a set period after his uh, his ban. So Newcastle want Phillips, but are a bit kind of, uh, well, let's say not willing to stump up the, the demands that City want for a loan. Um, and uh, some senior executive in Newcastle has been talking this week about FFP, uh, well, the, the profit and sustainability rules, which are the new, new FFP and, and and the need to be prudent and not spend too much money and maybe have to sell some of their own players in order to uh, reinvest in new stars because of the way that sort of transfers are put down on the books. Um, and so they're, you know, not screaming that they're in a position to be able to afford Calvin Phillips. Um, but City, as far as I know, are not a charity. They're a a football club run as a business and they want to make as much money as possible. And they don't really want to uh, say to a premier league rival team. Okay. You have one of our players for free to fill a key position in your team and uh, we will pick up the tab. So there's still kind of lots of, lots of negotiations to be had on that. Um, and you know it's in Phillips is in Newcastle is probably the best option for Phillips so it's in his interest to kind of push that through but at the same time you know Newcastle need to push it through they can't just rely on City kind of rolling over which we know just kind of doesn't really happen under Cheeky Bagheeriston so um, that's kind of the main sticking point at the moment and it feels like Phillips has to move you know if he wants this if he wants to get playing time ahead of the Euros but at the same time like City aren't really fussed like he he's not kicking up he's not moaning at his lack of minutes at at City he's not like a bad face one of Guardiola's bad faces around the the dressing room or the training pitch so it's not like it's in City's interest to to get rid of him he's he's part of the match day squad um so the onus is really on Newcastle or any other interested party to um, to really negotiate with City and pay what they feel 
and an England international who Southgate says is the second best six in the country um, it, it is worth. Um, you know, I know he's he's not really done it at City, and it and it's to the bafflement of just about everyone because you know I don't remember people saying it was a bad signing at the at the time, but you know City will be selling him on the basis of what he's achieved elsewhere. Um, and his stock among other managers and and clubs. So if you know if if a deal with Newcastle is to get done, which will probably be a a loan given their situation, um, then some they're, they're going to have to get a lot closer on valuations and and money handed out because, like I say, City aren't going to sort of let him go for free. Okay, I guess I guess the Calvin Phillips signing was similar to like the Ake signing where he came in and it was like oh. Didn't expect that, but Ake has gone and proven his worth and he, his his ability. Whereas Calvin Phillips has come in, and you thought, do you know what? I can see why they've signed him. He, he was probably the Leeds' best player at the time, or certainly their one of their best players. You can sort of see why they signed him. One one to have in rotation in the squad, but it's just never happened. I think he scored his first goal, didn't he, in that that dead rubber Champions League game? Was it a penalty as well that he scored? So. And and it's just like what 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 is going on behind the scenes? Like how how is he in training? And what like, I think Pep Guardiola has like openly apologized to him, hasn't he, in press conferences and said, like, I treat him badly or whatever he said. It's like, you know, why why I guess for the if, if he's earning 150 grand a week or whatever, you're probably happy, you know, and getting coached by the best coach in the world. Um, so you're not gonna be too bothered. But I it, it seems like the only transfer saga around Man City is Calvin Phillips. And he, as far as I'm aware, he's never come out and said, I want to leave. But you sort of get the impression that you just can't get in the team. Why would you? Why would you want to stay? And I think was it Juventus pulled out recently. That they were linked to him last week, and obviously City now play Newcastle. So you would imagine if he is going to go there, he'll go after after the weekend potentially. Yeah, I think so. Although I don't think it's kind of like a, an agreement has been made. Let's just wait until after this weekend. I think you know there's still plenty of work to be work to be done and um, yeah I mean uh, I think Ake was one of the players that Phillips spoke to last summer um, and Grealish as well because there are plenty of examples of players who uh, had their first season and it didn't really go too well at City but they you know they were able to turn it round whereas um, Phillips just hasn't and you know fair play to him in summer for saying no I want to stay I want to stay uh, but it became pretty evident quite early on this season that yeah, Pep still can't visualise a place for him in the team, and is still picking other players, you know, multiple other players ahead of him uh, whenever there's the chance to to play Phillips. So you know, he 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 needs to get a deal done if he wants to play more regular football and and go to the Euros because you know he, he's in real danger of kind of um re- someone like Rico Lewis going ahead of him, and you've you've got like Cole Palmer and others coming into the England equation. Um, So every kind of game that he sits on the bench is a game where someone else can put their case for going to, to the Euros ahead of him. So, so he needs to get it sorted, but I, you know, I don't think it seems close at the minute. Yeah. So moving on to Newcastle then, Uh, we were talking about this sort of off air before we're just sort of having a quick look through Newcastle's home record against Manchester City and both of us were quite surprised to see that their home record is actually not very good especially you know since let's just just having a look now so since around 2005 Newcastle have won drum roll three home games against Manchester City and that's not three in like six games there's been I'm looking at I think there's at least 20 games here where they've played and the, the the most recent win was obviously the League Cup. Prior to that, loss, loss, draw. Uh, sorry, at home. Sorry, we'll look at home. So prior to that, it was draw, loss, 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 draw, win, loss, draw, loss, 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 draw, loss, loss, and then they won in 2005, and then they won, they won, the previous game in 2004, the previous game in 2003 and 2003 and so on. So Newcastle's home record against Man City has been, at least in recent history, 
has been abysmal. So City are going up there at the weekend. Obviously, they've had this investment. It's the the Saudis versus the Abu Dhabis, I guess, on on paper. How how does this game go, Sai? Does City get revenge? I think any any time someone walks away from St James's Park with three points, they're very happy. You know, City seems to have done it more than more than we remember. But Newcastle have given them, you know, a, a lot of good games there. Um, and certainly last season, City went one 0 up, and kind of within a blink of an eye, they were three one down. Now, you know, they fought back very well to get it to three three, but it's tough. And we saw, you know, Liverpool this season down to 10 men losing in injury time until Darwin Nunes turns it round for him. Arsenal went there as leaders lost. So it, it it's very, very difficult for, um, for teams Chelsea losing as well. Um, and United, I think. Um, so any city victory will be seen as a, as a major win. Um, it will be seen kind of less, emphatically maybe by Newcastle fans who know that you know Newcastle are missing a lot of players they've got a, a hell of a lot of players out and that's what we've kind of seen from them over the last month or so where uh, injuries have really taken their toll on the squad and they sort of were in a very promising position in the Champions League and now out of Europe and um, out of the um, out of the Carabao Cup um, at Chelsea late on so you know it, it's been disappointing for Newcastle recently and that doesn't look like ending with kind of the news that Joe Linton's out for out for six weeks so it it, it should go in City's favour that Newcastle have a weakened team but like I say it, it's um, it, it is really difficult still to get a get a result at St James's Park and a, a 5.30 kickoff means that the, the crowd will be bang up for it and it'll be freezing as well. Yeah, although less freezing than I thought it would be, actually. I sort of had a panicked look because I thought there was snow coming, but um, it's, uh, I think we might be in the, the heady sort of three or four degrees. That's, uh, that's, that's warmer. I keep, I keep seeing the news and, and the weather and it's like the snow's coming, the big freeze is on its way and just hopefully you don't get stuck in it. I hope it doesn't happen while, you, while you're on your way home at least. Yes, yeah, that's the main hope. So how do we see the uh, the team lining up then, Sai, uh, given given you, we talked earlier about Kevin De Bruyne not coming straight back into the team? Do we do we see a repeat of City's last starting eleven against Huddersfield or a bit more rotation again? Yeah, I think um I think Akanji's a doubt after his injury. Um so yeah, I mean Edison comes back in, you would think, and then you'd have Walker and Diaz and Ake and Gavardiol. Probably at the back, Rodri, Foden, um, maybe Kovacic in there. And then Bernardo Silva back with probably Grealish and Alvarez. Um, you know, De Bruyne said he's expecting to be on the bench. I think you would expect him to be on the bench. The other things, Oscar Bob had a very good second half against Huddersfield, but will probably be back on the bench. And then Jeremy Doku really is the the sort of one that nobody's talking about, but came off the came back from injury and, and back on the score sheet. We know how explosive he can be. So, so there's a chance he kind of um, ousts uh, Grealish on the left wing. There's also a chance I've completely forgotten about someone um, who should be in the 11, but uh, may, maybe I'll, I'll remember them later. Yeah, I, I think I'd still be surprised if Haaland started uh, and, you know, there's a chance maybe that he's not in the squad. So uh, similar to Huddersfield um, with you know, one less if a kanji isn't isn't ready. But I think the bench will be more will be ready to give more options than it maybe has in recent matches. Yeah, and the beauty of it for City coming up is that after Newcastle they've got a week break, then they've got Spurs in the FA Cup. Providing that is a one legged affair, they've then got Burnley at home, Brentford away, Everton at home, and then the Champions League away at Copenhagen and then Chelsea at home and Chelsea, you know, on paper they're a force, but reality is that they're, they're rubbish this season. And then Bournemouth away before the Manchester Derby on the man, on the 2nd of March. So that's a really good run of fixtures for City to bring a lot of players back and, and give minutes to players that are not necessarily in that starting 11, you know, against your, your biggest rival type thing. Um, and obviously the, the, the run that they've had up until this, they've had a, you know, similar, it's like the reverse fixtures, Brentford at home, um, well, that was that was postponed. So that's that's the the 
that'll be later on in the season, won't it? Everton away, and then obviously the Club World Cup, which you know is. As, as grateful it is to win that, the, the opposition isn't as strong as, as you would get in the Premier League. That dead rubber against Red Star and Palace was probably the toughest game in that run, really. So, you know, it, it's it's good timing for, for these players to come back for City and, and hopefully if Haaland isn't necessarily going to be needed, he might get a bit more of a rest and, and let that foot, um, that foot injury fully recover and see, you know, get him some minutes against maybe Chelsea, Bournemouth before, uh, before the the uh, visit of Manchester United but Si we'll end it there we've had a good nearly an hour you're off to the press conference now so for anybody listening we are recording this before the presser so if any big stories break between now and the presser uh, just know that this was recorded prior to that (laughs) (laughs) just to cover our backs yeah Um, and we will hopefully be back Monday but pending availability it may be Tuesday but Si is always on the mic ready to go it may be myself so if you hate me or you love me well, you may hear me, you may not, but we will see. Sai, hope you've enjoyed. I hope you've enjoyed something a bit different with myself. Uh, hope I've not been too, yeah. too off topic. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, a lovely change. Lovely. Right. Well, great to talk to you. And uh, it's half 11 now, so you need to get off to the press conference. So we will catch you in a bit. Don't forget to like, subscribe, leave us a five star review. Don't leave us a review if it's not five stars. (laughs) And we will catch you in the next Talking State podcast very soon.